You're listening to Health Coach Conversations, a podcast where our conversations help health coaches all around the world to level up our businesses and to get more clients. Today we have Elise Lonin. She's a New York Times bestselling author and the host of the podcast, Pulling the Thread, which she interviews cultural luminaries and the big question of today, including people like Loretta Ross, Pico Iyer, Dr. Gabor Mate, and Terry Real. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling On Our Best Behavior, The Seven Deadly Sins and the Price Women Pay to Be Good. Elise lives in Los Angeles with her husband, Rob, and their sons, Max and Sam. Elise has also co-written 12 books, including the New York Times bestsellers previously. She was the chief content officer of Goof, while there, Elise co-hosted the Goop podcast and the Goop Lab on Netflix and led the brand's content strategy and programming, including the launch of a magazine with Condé Nast and a book imprint. For the podcast, she interviewed hundreds of thought leaders, doctors, and experts, including Ibram X. Kendi, Brian Stevenson, Nicholas Kristoff, Ambassador Samantha Power, Rebecca Traster, John and Julie Gottman, among others. Prior to Goop, she was the editorial projects director of Condé Nast Traveler. Before Traveler, she was the editor at large and deputy editor of Lucky Magazine, where she also served as the on air spokesperson, appearing regularly on shows like Today, E, Good Morning America, and The Early Show. She has a BA from Yale and majored in English and Fine Arts. She also went to St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire. Before that, she attended a school where lunchtime were spent jumping an irrigation ditch. Originally from Missoula, Montana, it's important to her that people know that she went to the National Mathletes Championship when she was in eighth grade and that she's a horse whisperer. There's These days, she serves on two boards, Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams and Skin Fix, advises a beauty biotech startup, and spends her time writing, reading, and fundraising for causes and politicians focused on environmental action, social justice, women, and children's health in a more equitable world. I'm here with Elise today, and Elise, we have talked about your great background and your book. Can you tell us about the inspiration behind your book on our best behavior and what drove you to write it? Yeah, I think I wanted to understand in myself this compulsive and insidious voice inside of me that was constantly asserting that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't thin enough. I wasn't a good enough mother. I wasn't a good enough partner or cook or homemaker, whatever, whatever, fill in the blanks. And I really wanted to understand where this voice was coming from and where these ideas of what it is to be a good woman, where they originated in our culture. Because as I looked around, I could see this script running in so many other women's heads as well. And the script is that a good woman is tireless or never tired, has no need for attention, affirmation, credit, or praise, doesn't have any wants at all, is happy to subjugate her wants, in fact, to other people's needs, but she doesn't really have her own needs either. Uh, She has no appetite. She has no sexual desire, though she's a willing partner and compliant and obedient. And she's really never upset or angry about any of this. And I think that people listening might recognize that as things that they also hold dear or close as a woman. And so I really wanted to understand what that was and why this same script doesn't hold men by the throat in the same way. And I backpedaled that list. I sort of identified its core components and realized that they it maps back to the seven deadly sins and that women are really conditioned for goodness. And this is regardless of any religious belief or political leaning, like this is so in our culture. It's not, actually the sins weren't even in the Bible, but that women are conditioned for goodness, whereas men are conditioned for power. Right. And then once I saw it, I just couldn't, I couldn't unsee it. It's everywhere. 
Yeah, I read, I listened to your book and there was a lot of things that came up for me, especially because I went to a Catholic school and <laughs> yeah, you get, a, you get a lot of that in religion. So I've got this long list of questions for you today and I know we won't get through all of them, but I'm going to get mine stuck in there someplace. <laughs> <laughs> So reflecting on the personal transformation that you mentioned experiencing through writing this book, moving away from self-regulation towards embracing simple joys, how do you believe that these changes have impacted your well-being and your relationships? Mm, well, it's a process. So I don't, I sort of chafe at any book including my own, if it if it professes to sort of solve everything in, in the course of 30 days or, or a week, right? As we all know, work is a process. This life is a process. Right. And so for me, it was a deeply therapeutic dive into my own unconscious as I was originally, I just wanted to diagnose culture and sort of hold back hold myself back. And then my editor was like, you have to put yourself in this and show how you also relate to all of these as our guide through the material. And that was hard. That was hard. And I feel like maybe I got I, I in the process of writing and working on the material, I got through the first onion and now I'm into the second deeper layer of understanding how these things like scarcity and whatnot are so deep inside me. But I, my hope with the book and what I try to do in all my work is just show us what show us what we're up to, and create or illustrate the, these larger systems that have us by the throat. It's like seeing the matrix. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Doesn't mean that you're immediately free, but at least you have a better handle on what's happening. Do you think that this is something that we have to do for ourselves or can we help other people with it or can we be helped with it? This is collective work, certainly. I think so much of our culture sort of pushes this myth of individuality and anything that's happening to you is part of your own psychology and it starts in your family of origin. And I think we're we're moving past that concept. Sure, that that's true to some extent, but Culture is huge and trying to, I think anyone who's a parent would know trying to parent against culture is very hard, right? And similarly, it's really difficult to liberate yourself from these ideas of what it is to be a good woman and stand alone. Because for one, you'll be vilified and continually sort of painted as a bad person by saying, I don't care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be gluttonous. I'm gonna be Slothful. I'm gonna do what I want, and I'm gonna be full of you know myself sexually. Like whatever it is, we have such an aversion to this in the collective that you can't do this by yourself. So this is collective work in small groups. You know, just watching each other, like noticing each other's um, language to say, like I heard you just say that you were bad yesterday because you had a burrito, and now you're gonna be good just sort of pointing out the way that we moralize in our language and moralize about ourselves in this quest for goodness is work I think that's done much faster and more efficiently in group. Good. That's that's good to know. Um, burning the morality map for true self-definition is a powerful call to action in your book. How do you navigate this journey personally and what challenges have you faced in pursuing true self-definition away from the cultural and social expectations? It's hard. It's really hard. This good girl programming is so deep in me and this desire to always be seen as sort of embodying these qualities of the feminine, right? That care and compassion and kindness and it's also hard because we destroy women who dare to be seen. So this is what the chapter in Pride is about, just sort of our tendency collectively to shoot down visible women, regardless of which category they're in. And we usually do it through reputational harm, saying that they're a bad person and that they're, they're unkind or pointing to some sort of moral failing. And so it's really hard. And this stuff is so loaded and so unconscious that... When you wait, I'm in the middle of this right now. We're talking as 
just after this Andrew and uh, Andrew Huberman piece in New York Magazine came out about sort of his mm, abusive behavior towards women and deep deception. And I had written a whole podcast series a month or so ago about how these prominent, very popular male podcasters do not platform women. Andrew Huberman has had 12, now 13 women on his podcast. So 8% of guests. And I did that not because I have an ax to grind with Andrew Huberman. He means nothing to me, but that I want to expose to ourselves the way that we venerate these men and see them as primary experts on our bodies and on our experiences and that they don't really care to platform women. And this is maybe not the, maybe a too complicated of an example, but just on Instagram and, and whatnot, I'm watching, I'm watching women um, accuse me, the writer, the the women in the story, five women whom he was, they all thought they were in a monogamous long-term relationship with him. One was trying to get pregnant with him through IVF. Like it's a very strange, highly deceptive story, high, high deception. But watching women specifically accuse me of witch hunting him or trying to tear down trying to tear him down. And it, it, it's just so meta. It's so mm-hmm. meta. And this is how deep this stuff is. So like we're tugging at the deepest, the deepest roots here. And, and part of what I'm observing is that these women, instead of saying, you know, this is unfortunate and I feel deeply sorry for these women, but it doesn't change my feelings for him and I want to keep listening to him and I like him. But it's this instinct in us when, you know, in some ways, the book is about the collective shadow of women and the way that we repress and suppress everything that we've been conditioned to believe is bad and then project it onto other people. So what I'm seeing is that these women, in an effort to justify themselves or defend their own feelings about him and to defend him, which is always fascinating, they need to deprecate. They need to take this badness and put it on the women, the writer of the story the women who he emotionally abused and in some senses me that I have like some that I want to take him down. It's very interesting. It's very meta, but like, I mean, it's just that that's alive in me right now because this is, that's pretty big big. too. It's big. Yeah. It's it's big. It's really interesting. And he'll be fine. Like he will be a hundred percent. Nobody needs to worry about Andrew Huberman because reputational damage for men is meaningless. (laughs) <laughs> it is well it just is yeah well and, and maybe he'll learn something from it if he listens to any of it <laughs> maybe he probably won't no he probably yeah won't. yeah no yeah. it's interesting sorry i took us off track that's all right that's on track really because that's the kind of stuff that we run into yeah. um Given the complex history of women's roles in religious and context and broader societal norms, how do you think individuals can recognize, reconcile, not recognize, reconcile their faith with the empowerment and re-evaluation of women's roles today? Yeah, I think it's really important because I think a lot of people might look at my book and think that I'm ripping apart Jesus or that I'm going to assault their faith. And I am a person of faith. I'm unaffiliated, but, and I'm a, um, my dad's Jewish. My mom, she calls herself a recovering Catholic. That's how she refers to herself. That's not my designation. Um, But I love Jesus and I love Mary Magdalene. And the book really is about, for anyone who's really gone into the history of the church and the creation of so many of these systems of belief, this is the game of telephone across millennia interpreted by men at the hands of men. And then these things go on to take, to sort of metastasize in culture and take completely different forms. So I write in the book, one chapter at the beginning, that's, it's the most dense chapter, but it's a brief history of the patriarchy. It's hard to boil it down. It's so complex and it emerges in different ways across the globe. Just because I had to learn, I had sort of thought of patriarchy as this boogeyman and this inevitability and the way it's always been. And as I've come to understand we've always been far more creative and far more affiliative than it hasn't always been this gender-based oppressive culture. There were times when we were really doing life together. And as we learn more about our prehistory and as our science develops, 
it's becoming more and more creative and complex where it's like, oh, there were female Vikings, there were female warriors and all of these grave sites at almost equal numbers to men. Uh, so we're we're seeing that it's a, it's a much more interesting story. But back to the question of faith, I think people who love Jesus or come from that faith tradition, if they go back and actually read what he supposedly said, although he did himself did not write, he talks about having a physical a male body and a, a female soul. He he's a feminist. There's no nothing he does not speak in oppressive or dominant ways. If anything, he takes himself out of the power structure of the time to show people the power structure of the time. And I write a fair amount. I was very inspired by Mary Magdalene and her gospel, which was deemed heretical and cast out. But even people who don't know her gospel, which is very much about, which is supposedly, you know, he, and this is in the New Testament, he resurrected to her. She is the first apostle. He gave her his first teaching. This is part of the New Testament. But then her, the teaching is her gospel. And that was deemed heretical and cast out. And Peter was made the first apostle. And then what's worse is that the sins, they weren't in the Bible. They emerged out of the Egyptian desert in the fourth century by a man named Evagrius Ponticus, who's also credited as an early father of the Enneagram. And they sort of made their way amongst the desert fathers. And then it wasn't until 590 AD that Pope Gregory turned them into the cardinal vices. They were originally eight thoughts, and he dropped one, which is sadness, which I include in the book. He turned them into the cardinal vices, and he assigned them all to Mary Magdalene. And in the same homily, he turned her into the woman who anoints Jesus' feet with her hair, which is a different woman. But he, And then he takes the two of them, conflates them, and calls them a penitent prostitute. And so that's where that reputation came from. And she wore that reputation as the carrier of these deadly sins for millennia. It wasn't until, I think, 1980 that the Pope, Pope at the Francis, time was like, right? and then Pope Francis in 2016 yeah. was made her the apostle to the apostles. Yeah. But prior, it was, I think, 1980 where they were like, we kind of got that wrong. Oops. <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Oh, oh darn. We just took like one of the most, if not the most important, maybe Mother Mary is more important, but and turned her into a whore and the carrier of depravity. So you can just start to understand how when this gets seeded into us as truth, how that distorts the way that we think and behave. But I think that for women of the faith, when you go back to these original sources and you understand how much misogyny was inserted into Paul as the Bible was translated and translated and translated, uh, that by men, you start to understand, wait, whoa, there's like a totally different interpretation of this at hand if we just open our eyes and look. So I don't want anyone to feel from my book like I'm I'm judging their faith or that they have faith. It is more that we have been fed stories that maybe are not so true or that we certainly need to look at. I think that almost everybody has to have sat in church who went to church and when they come to the part about the women being subservient or whatever, you're saying, mm -hmm. I don't think I need to say him into this. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't feel true. It's, no, I just it's just right. not resonant. Nor when you look at sort of the creativity of our expression today, is it like, oh, this is a new invention? Oh, suddenly women have brains and brawn and a desire to do something in the world. Like, what happened? Did our genetics change? If patriarchy were so natural, we wouldn't chafe against it. Right. Yeah, it would feel right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for health coaches and for wellness practitioners, how can we help? with this? What can we do for people who are maybe suffering things that shame, maybe, yeah. that they don't need to suffer? I think that what's interesting, and I think that this is nah, maybe true of men too, but certainly true of women, all of these sins or most of these sins sort of Venn diagram and collide in the body. And I think that we women through 
trauma, through self-hate, et cetera, are generally totally disembodied, if not dissociated. I know dissociation is its own experience, which I sometimes have experienced myself, but we're certainly not in our bodies in the way that I think that it would be very helpful to be. And so I think like at the most loving thing a health coach can do is to sort of get women re-embodied and re-in touch with our appetites, our desires, our boundaries, uh, our suppressed and repressed emotions. I think most of us are full of rage that we've had to stuff throughout our lives because we do not allow women in our culture to be angry without calling her all sorts of names. Meanwhile, when a man is angry, we still, this is Harriet Lerner's work, but we still find a way to blame a woman. He's a son of a bitch, a bastard, et cetera. Still the woman's fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I think that we are just full of it and full of all this unprocessed emotion. And through that, we become disconnected. And so I think the, and I think that when, if we could learn how to love our bodies again, how to listen to our bodies, how to trust their wisdom and the knowledge that we get from our senses that might not be so cognitive, I think it would be so healing. That's where I have been really trying to focus myself now that I have all the cognitive information and I like to stay up in my brain is like, okay, how do I find this in my body? How do I, how do I stay with myself as I'm experiencing this encounter which feels scary to me or where I feel upset or where I feel like disrespected or whatever it is. For me, I've had to relearn how to be with those emotions and that feeling live. You went through the seven deadly sins. Was that helpful to kind of break that down in your experiences and your feelings and all of that and then work from there? Yes. And it's interesting, like one of the things that I hear a lot from readers of the book is that they are like, oh, I know I have gluttony. Like I know how I abuse myself about (laughs) Everybody would say that. (laughs) Right. Or I know I have issues around lust or or anger, but then they're like, but I don't have this and I don't have issues with money and da, da, da. And then they read it and they're like, oh God. Yeah, I see that. (laughs) And so, because I think there are so many amazing thinkers in our culture who have tackled these subject matters individually. There are like lots of amazing people writing about women in anger or women in food. And, but what I wanted to do was show how they're all connected and that they're all part of the same system and they live in us as one system in one house. And so I think it's a useful frame for people to start to identify. And there might be more and there might be fewer. But I think it's a it's it's a pretty all encompassing guide mm-hmm. to these assaults on goodness. Right. Yeah, I I thought it was interesting that you talked about envy and how that could be turned around to be a good thing. Yes, exactly. I think these are all very human. This is how we contact the world. This is how we show up in the world as ourselves. And So part of what's happening, the crime of this, is that women are not fully expressed in either in their own lives or or sort of in the wider culture. And envy, I write about as the gateway to the other sins, because if you can let it come up and, and actually work with it, it shows you what you want. And the person who's inspiring your envy is doing something or has something that you want. And traditionally, we, because or my theory, I guess, is that because it makes us feel bad, it makes us feel so uncomfortable. We don't really even diagnose it as envy. We don't let it emerge in our consciousness to that extent. So we just deprecate the woman in question and we make her bad so that we can feel better. We make her bad for inspiring our envy. And the reality is like, if she wasn't touching something in you, you wouldn't have any feelings about her. But we make it about her rather than recognizing, oh no, she's full of information for me, about me. This is my soul saying, pay attention to this. This is There's something here for you. She's pushing on a dream you have for yourself. Figure out what that dream is and allow it to even emerge because so many of us like don't have any idea what we want. I put myself in that camp and I was completely unconscious about how 
envy had me in its thrall and how I would use it as an excuse, a completely socially acceptable excuse to sort of demonize and destroy or deprecate another woman. I don't think her book is that good. Why do people think she's so great? Who does she think she is? Oh, she rubs me the wrong way. I just don't like her. I mean, we know these the script. And then I think, but once you're like, wait, what? Whoa, whoa. Okay. What's happening? And we can do this lovingly with each other. What's happening? Let it come up. What's, what is going on in your body? What is she pushing on? And let, like, let's look at it and understand why. Because then you can use it. You can take that woman who grates your hide. And you don't have to like everyone, by the way, sometimes. But you'll be able to identify the behavior that you don't like or that you feel like is harmful or hurtful. It's usually not about the person. The person is nothing to you. But you can use it. This is Lacey Phillips' work, and she calls it using people as expanders. But you take that woman who is doing something that you want or has something that you want, and instead of destroying her, you say, okay, how can I do this too? I'm going to study her. I'm going to watch her. I'm going to ask her for advice, ask her for help. And it's sort of this opportunity for us all to get bigger. And and all the sins Venn diagram with each other. So it's closely associated, envy is closely associated with pride. And it's also closely associated with greed and scarcity. And this idea that's real and imagined for women that there's really only room for one. So if she has it, I can't have it. And to have it, I need to dethrone her or destroy her. We have to stop that. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. yeah, it is. We A lot of us do that to ourselves too. I, there's so many people that expect perfection from themselves. And if they see something that they don't like in themselves, and they're really hard. Yeah, 100%. Is there anything else that I have forgotten to ask about? I've got, I've got questions on every single deadly <laughs> sin. And I know nobody wants to sit here and go through all the deadly <laughs> sins. So... <laughs> Is there um, anything else that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> um, no, I think just that, like, be gentle. Um, I think, and I think that as we move out into the world, being hyper conscious about what's alive in us just goes such a long way. And just to be kind, be kind. Like, we're we're full of fear. We're full of anxiety. Like, just be gentle. Be gentle with yourself, particularly as you go through this process, because I think our immediate instinct then is to shame ourselves for like being so easily shamed. You know, it like dri- yeah. it drives. <laughs> there the you go. <laughs> um, we, can, we can get yeah. it on anything. <laughs> exactly. So like be gentle and and as loving towards yourself as you can while also holding yourself accountable, because in the process of letting this understanding or seeing sort of what you're up to, I think there's a lot of freedom on the other side. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate it. I love the book. I recommend anybody that's listening to this, either listen or read the book. It's great. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating or review on iTunes. 